All right. So a couple relevant questions to get started today um, about uh, Redox stuff. Um, this first question I like because I very rarely get to answer with absolutes. Almost every time you're going to get an answer from me, it's going to be, well, most of the time, yes. Like, well, for this class, yes. Um, however, this one, because it's based not around the physics, but around the English language, um, is the oxidizing agent always the compound that's being reduced? I can unequivocally say yes, because that is the definition of that term. The oxidizing agent is the compound being reduced by definition, always, no exceptions. Um, and agent always means it's a reactant. The old school term for a reactant was actually reagent, it's a reacting agent. Um, so a reactant is the agent. So it's always going to be, if I have you label, oxidizing agent, reducing agents, always going to be on the reactant side of things. You just need the product side to know if it's been oxidized or reduced, right? You have to be able to compare it to where it ends up. Um, but it's all, you're always going to be labeling whatever is on the reactant side as oxidizing agent, reducing agent. Um, somebody asked, why don't we multiply the standards half cell potentials by the coefficient? So if we're multiplying the whole half cell by, by a number to make the electrons balance out, why don't we multiply the half cell potential? Um, and that's because it, remember that the half cell potential, it's really talking about the difference in energy um, of the two states before and after. It's not really normalized by... Um, by the number of by the number of electrons. So if we have two different energy levels, and this energy could be in kilojoules, if you've got electrons here and they can go downhill in energy to become to this level, the cell potential is the I said I wrote kilojoules here, but then I use volts. The, dis the difference between these two heights is the cell potential. The total amount of energy is based not just on the difference in the heights, but also how many electrons make that journey. And so that we that's why that n term shows up in the Nernst equation, right? That E equals E naught minus RT over nf ln of q that n term is in there because that's taking into account the fact that in order to get the electrons to cancel out they have to be the same number of electrons and that's going to affect the total amount of energy in the system but the, at its most basic the cell potential is not based on the number of electrons just on what these two heights are right? and so that's that's why we don't multiply the cell potential at all. All we're ever going to do with the cell potentials from those tables is flip the sign, right? And then the fact that we have to go and we're trying to make them cancel out those electrons, we're going to have an N and that's where the N shows up. That's where that stoichiometry size shows up. Um, and then somebody asked about if we're thinking about voltaic cells as a circular system during the lab, where we had like the salt bridge, we had the electrons moving one way, and then we also had the salt bridge. Um, but then when we're writing the equations, we don't really, we don't really acknowledge that the salt bridge really exists. And it makes it look like the electrons are just moving straight from one side to the other side, like there's a net motion. We just need to know that the salt bridge is there to allow for charges to, to match each other so that you don't get a buildup of charge on one side versus the other. As long as the salt bridge is there, it's not going to affect anything about the, um, the stoichiometry or the amount of energy or anything like that. We just need to allow those, those ions, the ability to move back and forth. And as long as we do that, we can, we can focus on the electrons because that's those that the electrons are the ones that are actually changing energy levels. And the ions moving back and forth in the salt bridge are just there to balance charge, basically, they're spectator ions. 
you just still have to let them move so that you don't get one half cell being negatively charged and the other one being positively charged. Um, and then, so basically know that what a salt bridge is and why it's there, but don't worry about it beyond that. That's the best way to approach thinking about the salt bridge. Um, and then the second, the second question is, uh, or should we think about this in terms of equilibrium or stoichiometry? I mean, really both, both is good. Um, because yeah, stoichiometry still applies. And stoichiometry is still, is still applying to equilibrium even with our ice tables, right? When we're doing minus X or minus two X or plus three X in our ice tables, that is stoichiometry. It's just not showing it as one single conversion. It's got all of that sort of built into it, that whole stoichiometry step of one molecule of this turns into one molecule of that is built into the coefficients. Ice tables is just another way of doing stoichiometry. And so equilibrium and using ice tables is just a slightly more sophisticated way of, of doing stoichiometry. It's still stoichiometry though. Um, it just takes into account, we don't ever go to completion. Um, so it's equilibrium is pretty much always going to be the more accurate way to think about things. It's just sometimes we don't need to do that. Like if you think about a combustion reaction, combustion reactions are still equilibrium reactions, but we can just use straightforward stoichiometry with them because their equilibrium constant is so huge that we can basically say, okay, within sig figs, this is going to completion. It's not truly going all the way to completion. There's still going to be some tiny amount of leftover reactant because it is an equilibrium process. But at some point that just becomes splitting hairs and why bother if it's not gonna be measurable anyway, right? And that's why you learn stoichiometry first and then we come back and we unlearn stoichiometry a little bit and say, well, well, actually nothing really goes to completion. Um, chemistry in science in general, but especially chemistry is known for being for being that science, the well actually is always chemistry. Um, and it's the most frustrating part for most people is you're gonna spend a year learning how to do kinetics and equilibrium. And then the next chemistry class you take, we say, well, we made some assumptions, and some generalizations there that now we're gonna unpack. And you're gonna to have to unlearn the way that you've learned it before because we're diving deeper now. Um, that's just kind of how chemistry works. We work, it's not that we're teaching you it, wrong at this level we're teaching you general rules and we're then we're teaching where those general rules fall apart and why they fall apart and how we can fix that and then we'll say well and even those fall apart sometimes we talk about polar molecules when you get to ochem we have a whole different way of thinking about polarity when we're talking about ochem um, because we have a different frame of reference and you know more so we can we don't have to make all the same assumptions and generalizations we can dig into those and figure out where they fall apart. Um, so is it, if you have to, you don't really have to choose between thinking about things in terms of equilibrium or stoichiometry. Equilibrium is always more accurate. It's just sometimes unnecessary. The point is where I was going with that. Um, once again, Costa's not here, so. We'll, we'll leave semiconductors. Well, that's a good one to hang on to question anyway, because after we get past the midterm and, and uh, radioactivity, there's a whole chapter on semiconductors. Um, so we'll talk about how semiconductors work and what's called um, condensed matter physics, which is basically the fact that all those orbitals and everything that we've been learning about, all these energy levels we've been talking about, well, atomic orbitals only really existed until you made a covalent compound, right? And then you got hybridized orbitals. And those hybridized orbitals only really existed. They still don't really exist because as soon as you get something larger than five atoms, then those hybridized orbitals are really hybridized. The real orbitals are hybridizations of hybridized orbitals. Everything just sort of starts mixing together. And if you start looking at the condensed phase, meaning a solid or a liquid, all of the different orbitals from all of the molecules wind up interacting with each other. And we wind up with a totally different way of looking at it that's going to be more closely related to electrical engineering and the electrochemistry than the orbitals we've talked about before, but they still behave like orbitals sometimes. 
So that's how semiconductor, I didn't really tell you anything other than you don't know anything yet. Um, but that's how semiconductors work basically is it's quantum mechanics happening um, at the scale where we're dealing with moles of atoms at a time. So it's weird because it's quantum mechanics, but at a macroscopic scale, um, which is hard to explain. That's why we have a whole chapter on it coming up. Um, and then last but not least, somebody asked about when do physics and chemistry differ in how they approach electricity and current? They don't really differ. Sometimes they just have a different frame of reference. Um, from the point of view of chemistry, oftentimes, for one, we're almost always just going to be looking at the direct current. We're just talking about how batteries work, not what do we do with a circuit. Physics deals with, in electrical engineering, deal with, okay, we have this current, how can we use it? Or how does it work when you put this current through a circuit? And so they're really two sides of the same point. You need to understand the chemistry to understand where the current's coming from. But then the physics says, okay, we have this current, how does it behave? It's not that they differ, um, we're just talking about different things, different aspects of the same phenomenon. Uh, and that's why physics majors are still required to take chemistry and why chemists are required to take physics um, because they they interact in a lot of ways. And sometimes they overlap and sometimes it's just different ways of looking at the same thing, same thing. And sometimes it's actually different concepts. Like we're not going to talk about what a transistor is. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what a diode is, but only at its most basic level when we get into semiconductors. Um, so keep taking more science classes if you want to know more about that interface between physics and chemistry when it comes to electric, um, electricity. Um, and basically we're not, the, the thing, way I can say, give a definite answer to this one is um, current as a concept is not something that chemistry deals with really. We talk about moles of electrons moving from one state to another state which is what physics calls current. Current physics is interested about what happens between A and B. We're interested in how many molecules start at A and end in B and what that difference in energy is. What happens in between is not something we're really going to get into in this class. So we kind of ignore current in that, in that way for this chemistry class. All right, let's do some rate law examples. So reminder that a rate law in general is always going to have this basic form. Rate of a reaction, which we can write in a lot of different ways, but just in general, the rate of a reaction is equal to a constant times concentration of reactant A to to a exponent, and we don't necessarily know what that exponent is. And then B to its a, an unrelated exponent. We just do that for as many reactants as we have in a reaction. So if it's a react reaction that has five reactants, we would have A, B, C, D, E, all with their own individual exponent. And the assumption that we're making right now is that X and Y, all the exponents have to be either zero, one, or two. And we'll show, I'll show you the way we can not make that assumption in a minute, but let's start with a simple case. So for this reaction, two nitrogen monoxide plus chlorine gas reacts to make uh, two NOCl. And we have a bunch of rates and initial concentrations. What's the rate law? I'll give everybody a second. Talk to each other. Remind each other how this works with the whole initial rates thing. Uh, so 
Uh, Why? Because no. Right answer, wrong reason. Just because it has a coefficient. So this is where low equilibrium first is not helpful. Because in equilibrium, we're used to, if there's a coefficient of two, that means it's going to be squared, right? That's not always the case with rates. Because with rates, all that really matters is what's the slowest step, not what's the overall reaction, what's the single slow step. And so sometimes you can have something that has a coefficient of two, but only has a one for its exponent. Which is why we need this data, why we can't just look at the balanced reaction. We don't need this data if we were just going to treat it like it's equilibrium, right? But in this case, when we look at this, how do we know what the exponents are going to be? Quadruple. What quadruple? The uh, rate. The rate quadruple. What happens to the concentration when the rate quadruples? Oh. The rate or the concentration double. And if it was proportional, if it was one to one, if you doubled the concentration, the rate should double as well, right? We doubled the concentration and the rate quadrupled. That's what it tells us is a squared. And I'll show you the way to mathematically solve this too. For me, the way I learned it first was just treat it like it's it's one of three options. It's, your exponents is zero, one, or two. How do we get an exponent of zero? If you, yeah, the rate, if you change the concentration, but the rate stayed the same, then you get a coefficient or you get an exponent of zero. If, you, if it's going to be an exponent of one, that means if you double the rate, the rate goes, the rate doubles. Or if you triple, sorry, if you double the concentration, the rate doubles. And it works too. We, doubling is consistent and easy to see visually. Um, but it works too if you multiply the rate or the concentration by three and the rate tripled, that's also one to one, right? In which case you'd have a coefficient or an exponent of one. And then the last case, if you double the concentration and your rate went up by more than double, it should be a nice even factor of four. Um, that's enough to say that that exponent is going to be a two. And we don't really see any, it would be a pretty exotic reaction that had a coefficient bigger than two. Zero, one, and two are all really common to see in chemical reactions. In theory, you can have something that was third order in a reactant, but it would be a really weird reaction. And that's sort of the, not the standard case. Standard cases are your 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 exponents are zero, one, or two. But like uh, half order reactions. Half order reactions are enzyme kinetic reactions when you can have other things happening. We'll we'll show I'll show you the mathematical way you can show those less common cases. The most common though, and those are the ones to always default to, right? Everybody know the saying when you hear horse when you hear hoof beats, think horses, not zebras. Don't go looking for the exotic case, the exception to the rule. In general, the general rule is general for a reason, right? So go look for zero, one, and two first. And if it's not one of those, then you can try this other method I'm gonna show you in a minute. Um, so that's all there is to figuring out the rate law. This is the rate law. We don't know what K is yet. We haven't calculated K. But if I say write the rate law for this reaction, 
That's what I'm looking for. Rate equals K times your concentrations, the proper uh, exponents. I keep saying coefficient, I mean exponents. All right, questions on that so far? Okay, so let's answer the rest of this. What is the rate constant? How do we figure out the rate constant once we know the exponents? Plugging values. We know everything except for K. For pick any one of these rows, and you have a rate and you have two concentrations, right? And now that we know what the exponents are, all we have to do is plug in numbers. So if, let's just use the first one, since it's the top one. Rate is 1.14. And that's molarity moles per liter per hour. So this is a slow reaction. In fact, we're measuring it in um, time units of hours, but it doesn't really matter. It's going to be some time unit. And it's almost always going to be in concentrations, moles per liter per hour. And then we've got you know concentration 0 0.50 squared and 0 0.50 to the one. for K. Um, just like with writing out um, atomic symbols and units for that matter, we need to be clear that this is a lowercase k. I'm not going to be too picky. Like You don't have to do it as a cursive k but make it clear from your writing that it's not an uppercase K because we got to keep equilibrium kin and kinetics separate, right? And the easiest way with my handwriting that I figured out how to do that was to make my uppercases K, our standard script print, and then my lowercase Ks I always put on this cursor. And so that, uh, that way I'm being consistent that way, just like making the C and Corey always by how to have it, I always brought as a cursive L, just so it's clear that that's an L and not an I. But you do what works for you in your handwriting. Just make it clear that you're talking about lowercase k. Um, and so we're going to be at something like nine. What are our units on k? Liters per hour. Per so we were moles hours. per liter per hour. Hour. So we're going to speak, there's still going to be in hours. There's still an hour component to it, right? Okay, actually, it's still going to be over per hour. Per hour. hour. It's going to be, we're going to divided by moles per liter three times. We started with moles per liter once. So it's one over hours times molarity squared. Basically, the units on K are not going to make sense. The units on K are just whatever they have to be to cancel out the units on the other ones. So capital M is moles per liter, right? So that's the same as saying one, but that's going to be liters squared over hours times moles squared. So it'd be the same thing, right? So a lot of times you'll see molarity written this way. If I'm pulling that eraser. Um, you'll see mol molarity written this way, but a lot of times it's more convenient just to keep it as the capital M because we're not going to be dealing anything where we're canceling out liters for leaving moles when we're dealing with rate loss. So you can just always just leave it as the capital M instead of writing it like this. And then that kind of makes it a little bit more clear what's going to happen with your units. Just 
spread it like that makes it look easier. It's a weird rate unit, but it kind of makes sense, right? If we're talking about rate of moving an object, we would talk about miles per hour, right? So, but if we're talking about how much we're making moles per liter per hour, it's not, it's a, not something we're used to, but it kind of makes sense, right? At least something that's not, it's not too far out there where I have to totally say, ignore the units on rate because they do kind of make sense. It's just weird. <laughs> All right, uh, one last note. Um, when we talk, I don't know if I defined this explicitly last class. Uh, when we talk about what order is the reaction with respect to each reactant, all we're talking about what is what's the exponent on each of them. So when we say what order is the reaction with respect to nitrogen monoxide, we say it's a second order reaction with respect to the nitrogen monoxide. It's first order reaction for the chlorine. The overall reaction, we call it the third order reaction. Um, and just, that's all it's gonna come down to is, it's just a way of communicating, oops, um, uh, you know, what, how changing these concentrations affects the rate. All right, so questions on these method of initial rates here. Definitely one of those skills where it's easy enough, and almost boring to watch when I'm doing it, but if I give you a blank piece of paper, it's a little bit trickier. Let's do another one. So this one's written as a word problem. We have a generic reaction, A plus B goes to C plus D. And we have an initial rate. And it doesn't matter what our concentration is necessarily, because it just says when the concentration of A is doubled, the rate remains the same. When our concentration of B is doubled, the rate doubles. What's the rate model? Well, A is to the zero power. It's still going to have our same general form, right? Rate equals K times A to the X, B to the Y. When we double the A, the rate remains the same. So that means that X has to be zero. So those are the easiest ones to find. When you make a change and not, nothing happens to the rate, it must not be significant part of the rate law, right? And what is Y? One. When you double B, the rate double. So it's gotta be one. The trick with that, where I see people making a, a logic mistake is like, oh, it said double, it's gotta be a two. The exponent is not a two. If the rate doubles because your concentration doubled, the exponent has to be a one. So just when you're going fast on your quiz or um, just in general working on these problems, that's a common pitfall. Just watch out for that. You're talking about an exponent. And then so our actual if I was writing this reaction out, what's A to the zero? What does that simplify to? One. Just one. Do we even need to write it? Do we even need to write the exponent for one? It's implied we don't write an exponent, right? So this is the simplified version of the rate law. <clears throat> Um, not for this one, because it doesn't actually ask you for K and you don't have any concentrations, right? So you're given an initial rate, but no other information. So you can't solve for K anyway. So that's kind of just a red herring. 
as I recall, this this question originally had more detail, and I I pared it down and I left that in there. I don't think it was an intentional decision. Um, the next slide, hopefully. The next slide has the extra information. There you go. But now we have to get K because now it's saying what is the rate when the concentrations are changed, but we're given the initial concentrations and the initial rate, right? So 0 0.030 molarity per second equals K times A doesn't matter. So we're given our concentration A, but it doesn't affect anything when it comes to the rate. The amount of, of a reactant that is not part of the rate law, it still means it can still be the limiting reactant if we we're doing stoichiometry with it. It just doesn't mean, it means it won't affect how fast we get there. Point two, yeah. What are our units now? One over seconds. Which physics book? What's that another word for? Frequency. Frequency hertz. One over seconds is hertz. That's the definition of hertz. So if we have K and we want, and now actual questions is what's the initial rate for different concentrations? We had to get K just so we can answer the, the real question. Plug in our value for K, plug in our new concentration for B. And we're back in molarity per second. So rate should almost always be in either molarity per second, or sometimes we'll do rate rate laws with gases, just like we did KP with equilibrium, where you just it was the same idea except you use pressures instead of molarities. So occasionally you might have a rate law where the where the rates units are going to be in atmospheres per second or torque per second or something like that. But it's always going to be an amount in of um, product per unit time. And we might change what the unit time is based on how fast the reaction is. Um, if a reaction is happening really slowly, it doesn't make sense to measure it in seconds. You'll measure it in minutes or hours or something. In theory, you can do it in days. Um, we see this actually in terms of uh, radioactivity, in terms of half-lives. We have measure half-lives, which we'll get into in the next chapter. Um, in units of millions of years sometimes, right? So your your time unit, if you were looked at the rate of that chemical reaction, your it might be molarity per millions of years. It just has to be some amount of product divided by some amount of time. All right, any questions on these ones? Let's go back to this one and let's let's look at the mathematical way we can solve for those exponents. Um, word of warning, it's gonna involve, it's going to involve some logs, or at least thinking about logs, which is not everybody's favorite. We can still do it in terms of process of elimination to some extent, though. Um, so 
The way we do this is we set it up. We write that generic form for the reaction. Rate equals A times concentration of NO to the X concentration of chlorine to the Y. And actually, I'm going to go to the blank on the screen real quick. Um, might as well be consistent since no need to be confusing, just be confusing. It doesn't really matter which order I write them in or whether I use X or Y for each of them, right? But I'm just trying to be consistent with the way we did it before. So if we want to solve for X or Y mathematically, we start plugging in numbers and getting, we're going to do it as a system of equations. If we just know a rate, was it 1.14, right? Equals K times, uh, and it was 0.5, right? And 0 0.50 to the Y. We, this is just one equation, right? That has three unknowns in it. We can't solve for the unknowns and get an actual value for any of them, right? If we have three equations or three unknowns. We need at least three equations to do that. So if we wanted to, usually there's there's probably a way to out, not probably, I'm, I'm sure there's a way to mathematically solve for K without knowing X and Y. Um, but that's not that's not the easiest way to do it. The easiest way is to figure out x and y first, and then k is really easy to get. So the way we're going to do this is we're just going to take any two lines, and we're going to compare them. And you fill them in um, right underneath each other. So line two it was what it was was it four point five six five six. And that was one point zero the x and 0 0.5 to the y. We have, now we have two algebra expressions, right? Now it's a system of equations. In order to fully solve everything, we're going to need a third one, but this is enough to solve for one of the, those um, unknowns. If we just take the bottom one, I guess I wrote it in the wrong order. Um, you take the bottom reaction and divide it by the top reaction. We're going to get K point five to the X point five to the Y. Anything, if we have two equations that are equal, we could add both, both of them together, right? We could multiply both of them. We just have, we know that these two sides are equal. So anything we do to one side, we have to do the other. If we take this, if we do this division, a bunch of stuff cancels out, right? What cancels out? That's y. 0.5 to the Y cancels out completely. So it doesn't matter what Y is, because Y didn't change, so it's gone. What else cancels out? K. Again, we don't know what K is, but it doesn't matter because it didn't change. So then we wind up with do this math and we get is it exactly four? Yeah. Four point zero zero. And then on this side we get one point zero to the X over point five to the X which is, we can simplify that, right? 1.0 over 0.5, all of that to the X. Two to the X equals four. In this case, because it's nice clean numbers, we can look at that and say what X is. We can just use like, oh, I know what X is because I know that two squared is four. If it's not nice, a nice clean number like that, you should still get something pretty close, or you can use logs. 
you log base two of both sides. And you solve for X that way, and you'll get X equals two. So is that faster than just looking at it and say, I doubled the concentration and the rate quadruple, therefore it's a two? It's a little bit slower. This is the math reason why we can say that. And if you can't see it, you ever get yourself in a situation where you're on a test and you're like, I can't remember how I'm supposed to tell if it's second order or not. This approach will never fail you. Because as long as you can do that and you can do some math and simplifying, some algebra and simplifying, you can get to something like this, like nine equals three to the X. And if it's not zero, one or two, this is also how you get what that exponent is. If you get something um, that is to the one and a half power, sometimes you have reactions that have that as their exponent occasionally. This is how you can actually show that that's true. And you say, well, instead of just saying, well, it's not zero, one or two. It's a half order reaction. You do this and you get X is equal to 0. 0.5. Once we know that X is two, how do we figure out Y? Now we just look at two rows and do the same exact thing. except we pick two rows where X doesn't change, but Y does. Okay, and it usually make it doesn't really matter which one you divide by the other, but it makes more sense usually to take the bigger rate and you divide by the smaller rate so that you're dealing with whole numbers instead of fractions, just because most people don't think well in fractions. But mathematically, it would make no difference. I didn't have to do it in the order that I did. Um, I just would have been one, one over four is equal to 0. 0.5 to the X. X is still two in both cases, but you're now you have to think in fractions. And then again, once I have X and Y, pick any of the three of the lines, plug in everything, solve for X. All right, any more questions at this point on method of initial rates? This is what we're going to do in lab next week. Um, Pre-lab is going to be, here's a bunch of raw data that's made up. Practice doing this, figure out the rate law for this reaction. And then lab on Wednesday and Thursday is going to be actually get your own data. Figure out X and Y yourself. Figure out, and it's the reason it's a little convoluted is not because the process is that, the math is pretty straightforward once you get a handle on what method of initial rates is. But like I mentioned before, figuring out a good way to measure a rate is kind of tricky. How do I actually measure how fast the molarity is changing per minute? And that's the part that's kind of like a couple of levels of, of abstract thought and can be a little bit tricky to get your wrap around, your head around. So, this is a convenient place to take a break. Let's come back at two, and then we're going to hand wave our way through some calculus. I won't make you actually do calculus, and we'll find a way to actually involve time and calculate time for these. I'll show the calculus for those of you who want to. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're doing tomorrow's old video. But I'm not even, I didn't even look at the stuff we did yesterday. I'm not going to look at it until like we did it after the test. <laughs> it seemed pretty easy, whatever it was. It was just, just more like uh, finding. Oh, we we're finding um, bands or like applying it. Like, yeah, it was more equations. I have like three problems. <laughs> I don't like Me neither. <laughs> look at this. Look at look at all that. Look at all that. Look at all that. Look at all that. So I think what? what? Okay, no. Yeah, this. Do I get this one over? Yeah. I haven't had a problem so much. Okay. Which one? Pattern one. I think I did it on one of these pages. Here it is. Here it is. Here's the final yeah. equation. Yeah, you said the equation. It's this problem. Oh, yeah. These two guys. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, well, I did it a few times. I did it a few times. <laughs> yeah, or I don't know where the other ones are, but I did it. I did it a lot. I feel pretty good. Oh, I remember that when I was the sphere of virtual is the last like this. Yeah, it's this one. <laughs> the two fifths MR. Gravity is one of them. It's also like I think that six is half of my height. Yeah. 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 It's a part of the equation when you move stuff around. It comes from these two, right? I don't know. That's really slow. You have kinetic energy. Yeah. And you have rotational energy. It's always like so. I don't know. It's like how it's not 30 different counterparts and stuff. I'm going to ask you. I played these games. No, I just like, I was just never told that I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. 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 i Sometimes you would take tests. But M is I. <laughs> Here it is. You know, but you assign to the and then like it becomes the yeah. yeah. You play like tanks. I think it's this. Like two fifths M R B. This stuff gets insane. It like two and R squared. That's like I, right? Yeah, R is and then R omega. Right. Oh, you I think you use to the right? So, yeah, same equation. I thought I just doubled. Mm -hmm.
I think I did stop just double the beginning, so I didn't actually think that. Okay, and then I already got this one. I can't get it. Calculate what I didn't understand. Oh, so you already have this? Yeah. Well, no, that's the wrong answer. I kind of forgot it. Oh, so you're going to have to get it <laughs> to answer this. And then... I tried it like probably five I, times. I used the, I used the brain. Right. Oh, it took me a while to like even just stand for that. I mean, I have it right here. You were Windows and like let's take out all the ones that have so, yeah. I don't know. Sorry. Sorry. It's like, kind of All right. After this one? Um, no. Oh, sorry, that MP or I was talking about was just for the session. She's not she's so, we're going to do some math. You're going to hear patient. As, as usual with the derivations, the derivation itself in this class is not as important as what we're going to get from it, but it's still helpful for understanding where these equations come from. Um, and what we're going to see, too, is this is a really common kind of not a mathematical trick, a mathematical technique that we use when we start dealing with um, doing calculus in sciences. So if we, the way we're going to look at this is um, if we take rate, instead of just writing a rate like we've been writing, if we actually write it in terms of a differential, like we started with, we used delta instead of a lowercase d, so it didn't look all calculus-y. But it's really the same thing, right? It's just a fraction. It's, it's the slope. It's rise, the change in y divided by the change in x. Um, and when we do that, we write that in terms of whatever, whatever is in the reaction, whatever the rate lies. So this is just for some reaction. It's first order in A and zero order in B. So our rate law is just equal to K times concentration of A. If we look at this reaction with respect to A, and we, we define our rate in terms of change in concentration of A as well, we wind up with this thing that looks kind of like an algebra expression. It is an algebra expression. Um, and while this, this piece here might kind of look that it is a calculus term for the derivative of a function, we can actually take that derivative and turn it into a fraction and treat it like it's a fraction. We can actually just separate this and multiply both sides by dt. And then we can actually put all of the like terms on the same side. So everything that has an a in it gets put on the same side of the equation. And everything that doesn't have an a gets put on the other side of the equation. And if you, again, if you've taken calculus, anytime you have something that a, an expression that ends in dx, or dt or d anything, you can take the integral of that. So all we're going to do is look at both of these. <clears throat> we're going to say, okay, I'm going to take the integral of both sides. Again, if you haven't had physics or if you haven't had calculus, um, the, the integral is like is undoing taking the derivative of something. It's basically finding the area underneath the function instead of looking at the function or looking at the slope of the function. And what we get if we use pretty, these are pretty easy integrals by calculus standards. If when we do that process, we get this function, which we call the integrated rate law. The integrated rate law is based on the original rate. We're going to have a different integrated rate law for all the different orders of reaction that we have. The integrated rate law for a zero order reaction looks different than the integrated rate law for a second order reaction. And they both look different than the integrated rate law for a first order reaction. 
because you're going to wind up with a different expression over here when you take the integral. And the integral is going to be different depending on whether this is 1 over a or 1 over a squared. Or if it's just a constant, if it's a zero order reaction. All right, so, but what this gives us, the reason this is useful is because now we have an expression where time is involved. We actually have a way we can plug a time in and get a concentration. Because up to this point, we've just been looking at at the change at the slope, right? We actually haven't done anything where we actually get a concentration at a certain amount of time. This is how you get a concentration after a set amount of time is by using these integrated rate laws because you need to integrate that process to take that DT term and turn it into time that you could actually plug in 10 minutes or five years or 0.5 seconds or one and a half million years, whatever your time is, if you want to find the concentration after a set amount of time, you use an integrated rate law. Um, and so this actually shows up all over the place. It turns out lots of reactions are first order reactions. Almost all reactions that involve something decaying or breaking down over time are going to be first order reactions. And those first order reactions always have the same form. The integrated rate law always looks the same for a first order reaction. Um, and this means that the other two terms that we get here, those for you, those of you in calculus, when you notice when I took the integral, I didn't put a, a, a plus C anywhere in there. I didn't have anything involving constant in there. Basically, that plus C means that. If we start from a slope and we try and get the original function back, we don't know what the intercept is. Really, right? And so what we used to figure that out is this A naught term. This is concentration at time equals zero. So that is our plus C term, our initial value for our, our initial concentration at time equals zero is what we plug in for A naught. And as long as we know the initial concentration at time zero, we can plug in any time we want and we can figure out what the concentration is. It's, it's not, we need also need to know the rate law or the rate constant, right? We need to know a little bit more information. Um, and we also need to know but the reaction is first order. Sorry, Boys and Girls Club was calling me. I was debating whether or not I can pick it up. But then I realized that my kids aren't at Boys and Girls Club yet, so they can't be calling me about anything really important. <laughs> um, all right, so we need to know it's first order. We need to know an initial concentration and we need K. But as long as we have those, this is a pretty useful tool, right? Like most tools, it's useful in the right context. It's not a one size fits all solution to everything, but it's pretty useful for solving certain quick um, problems like an insecticide washes into a lake. And so that the lake has a concentration of five times 10 to the minus four grams per cubic centimeter. If the insecticide decay is following first order kinetics and has a measured rate constant, what's the concentration of the insecticide after one year? That's not a particularly friendly looking word problem. But there's a key here. The fact that's asking about a concentration after a set amount of time tells us we've got to use integrated rate law. And the fact that it says following first order kinetics means we're using this version of the integrated rate law, the first order integrated rate law. So we just need to start figuring out what goes where. What's our initial concentration?
5.0 times 10 to the minus 7. That didn't have a meter concentration units. Does it matter what the concentration units are? Why not, Alexis? As long as we're consistent. They're showing up in a fraction here, right? So as long as we have the same units in top and bottom, they're going to cancel out. So it just means that our final concentration is also going to be in the same units. K is given. It just says rate constant instead of K, but K is equal to 1.45 inverse years, one over years. What's T? So now we just plug stuff in and solve for A T. So LN uh, X over, I don't know why I would switch to using X now. We haven't been doing that for a while. Concentration of A over 5.0 times 10 to the minus 7 grams per cubic centimeter equals negative 1.45 inverse year times one year. So units cancel out here, which is good because logs kind of wreck our units anyway, right? Anytime we take, you know, put, uh, do something where we have variables as an exponent or take log, units almost all just pretty much disappear, just like pH. We don't worry about the units once we take the log of it. So ideally our units should cancel out before we solve for what's in the log term. How do we undo natural log E? How do we use it? Yeah, we're going to do E to the power of each side. That cancels those out. So we're going to get E to the negative 1.45 equals this, this ratio. What do we get for our final concentration? 17 That was close. Just because I'm writing a concentration for weird concentration units, remember to keep your weird concentration units, right? Grams per cubic centimeter. You should be at 1.2, like with sig figs, or? Um, like I may have mentioned before, sig uh, exponential, exponentials and logs make the sig fig rules get weird. So, I'm not going to be too, too picky about that. That's three sig figs, which means actually we should keep. Uh, we wind up there's our two sig figs there. So yeah, one point two. Um, yeah, one point two times ten to the minus seven. We have to do centimeters. Now that y'all have been trained very thoroughly, pay attention to sig figs for multiplication and and addition. Um, we've now reached the part of the course where we're going to get a little bit sloppy with sig figs because exponentials and logs make everything get weird. As long as we don't forget those rules, they don't go away. 
we're just going to be sloppy when it comes to X, um, to doing algebra like this. That's kind of helpful, right? You know, it's a very specific type of question, but without the integrated rate law, we don't have a way to answer this question. It's not like it's reached equilibrium. So we can't use an ice table to do equilibrium. And we can't just do stoichiometry. We have to do it in terms of rates. And basically, these integrated rate laws apply to anything that is that is not at equilibrium will follow these integrated rate laws. Once it's reached equilibrium, this stuff goes out the window because now we have both reactions happening at the same rate, forward and backward, right? And so this kind of falls apart. But for now, we can say that anytime you got you're not at equilibrium, but you've got changing concentrations, we're going to go to rate laws. Um, the other way we can look at this reaction is in a way we've kind of seen before. If we take this, this integrated rate law, um, sometimes you see it presented as the linear linearized form, where basically just like we've done in some of our other expressions, you can write it so that it looks like y equals mx plus b. Um, and that also winds up being kind of useful. So we just looked at pressure of, of um, a compound versus time. So this is for a compound called, uh, this is isonitrile, methyl, isonitrile, I think. Uh, and you can see that this time is measured in, in tens of thousands of seconds. Um, if we just plot the pressure of that compound versus time, we get something that looks kind of like an exponential decay. But it's not necessary, and it, it is an exponential decay in this case. The thing is, is that second order reactions also look a lot like an exponential decay. So the way, one of the ways we can actually look at this, instead of doing method of initial rates, if we just have the raw data that looks like this, if we actually just plot natural log of concentration versus time, we get a straight line. And that doesn't happen if it's a zero order reaction or if it's a second order reaction. So this is actually one more way we have of figuring out what order reaction it is. Because if we plot this, if we plot natural log of pressure versus time and get a straight line, that is a smoking gun saying this is a first order reaction. 100% this is a first order reaction without needing a table of initial rates, which is convenient in reactions like this where we're measuring things in tens of thousands of seconds, or even, even more important, we're measuring the reaction in terms of tens of thousands of years. We don't really wanna do a whole bunch of method of initial rates stuff, right? Because getting that initial rate could take a really long time to get a measurable amount of the reaction to occur. So if we have one sample and we just observe it for an, an extended period of time and then plot the data, that's enough to figure out our rate law as well, whether it's first order or second order or zero order. And so, oh, there it is. Yeah, methyl isonitrile, that was close. Um, just have these slightly out of order here. It's not really, I was showing you that it, there was a linearized form. And then just blowing up that those charts and saying when natural log of P is plotted as a function of time, we get a straight line if it's first order. The other useful thing about this, just like before when we get these linearized forms of these complicated exponentials, a lot of times the slope is going to tell us something useful. In this case, when we, if I go back here, there's our slope. The slope of the reaction is negative k. If the, this is the y equals m, which is slope times x, which is t, plus the intercept, which is the, nat the natural log of our initial concentration. 
And so this graph and the fact that it's linear gives us a ton of useful data. We don't actually need to calculate K by hand if we have data that we can plot and get a phase straight line out. Of it. And so in this case, find the slope. Slope is negative 5.1 times 10 to the minus 5. Negative K equals slope. So what do we do with that? How do I ask you questions like that? Well, I guess first off, let's look at what happens if we have second order reactions, because all of that was first order reactions, right? Which means where there's going to be comparable equations for zero order and second order. If it's a second order process, like nitrogen dioxide decomposing to make nitrogen monoxide and oxygen gas, if we plot that data versus time, we get not a straight line. And when we take the natural log of that plot versus time, it's still not a straight line. So that tells us it's not first order. <laughs> the integrated rate law for a second order reaction, though, it's going to be one over the concentration gives us a straight line. So if we have one over our concentration of nitrogen dioxide and we plot it to get a straight line, that tells us it's second order in that reaction. And there it is. There it is. So what that tells us is we have a different integrated rate law for second order versus first order, like I already hinted. Here is the form for an, in the second order integrated rate law. The first order, zero, sorry, the zero order integrated rate law is really straightforward. Changing concentration doesn't affect the rate, right? So if changing concentration doesn't affect the rate, a zero order reaction means the reaction happens at a constant rate no matter what. In other words, if it's zero order, all you have to do is plot your concentration versus time and you get a straight line. If it's first order, we already went through that. If it's second order, the integration process gives us this form instead. One over A equals K times time minus one over A naught. I am not going to make you memorize these for the test. I will give you these on the test. However, you need to know how to use them. All right, so you need to know which one of them to use is to use the zero order, first order, second order. And I'm and I might just say, here's a graph of the data, and here's what it looks like as natural log of concentration, and here's what it looks like as one over A. What order is the reaction and how, which of these equations do you use? Right? In which case, you just look for the one that's linear and that'll tell you whether it's first order or second order or zero order. Right, so in, and in this case, when we plot this and get a straight line, there's not that negative term, but it's still the slope of the line is K. So if we know that the reaction is second order, we can figure out concentration after 600 seconds, after however many seconds we want. We just have to have the right information. Um, and I'm not going to make us find the slope by hand to get K. Uh, in this case, because this is the sort of question that normally we would throw in Excel, right? So here's a hint for your, for your take home final take home portion of your final for this class. I always like to add an Excel question in there because we spend a lot of time using Excel to analyze data, right? That's probably one of the single most valuable skills that you'll get out of this class is knowing how to use Excel. Almost just straight up telling you there's going to be a question just like this on the take home test. 
It says, here's some concentration and some time. What's the what's the rate law and what's K? But we don't have an Excel sitting in front of us right now. So we're not going to do that at this very moment. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is an idea called half-life. Who's heard of the term half-life before? Pretty much everybody, right? Not talking about the video game. It's more and more dated reference these days. I think Half-Life 2 came out when I was in college. Um, but anyway, um, half, what is half-life in terms of physics or chemistry? The rate at which something degrades, something about radioactivity. Those are all close. It gets used a lot with radioactivity because radioactive K is a first order process. Also like medication. Medication has a half-life. That's a pseudo, pseudo first order reaction. It's not quite a true first order reaction for most medication because like I've said before, enzyme kinetics is weird. It's not even a true half-order reaction. It's kind of like under some concentrations, it's a half-order reaction. And some what concentrations, it's more. Carbon is, so that's also a nuclear reaction. If you talk about carbon dating, the half-life of carbon-13, when we get into radioactive reactions, we'll find out that all radioactive, radio reactive, radioactive reactions um, are first-order reactions. And the reason it winds up being really useful so the def true definition of a half-life is it's the time to take that it takes to get to half of what you started. So we can actually solve these equations and by just plugging in, okay, well, what is T naught and what is, or what is the um, concentration at T naught and what is the concentration of the half-life? We can solve for, for the half-life. In the case of first order reactions, we say, okay, well, at the half life, if we, we represent as T with sub one half, at the half life, concentration of A is equal to half of concentration of A naught. Makes sense, right? That's just the mathematical way of saying what I just told you. It's the time that it takes to get to half of what you started with. So it doesn't matter what A naught is, the half life is the time it takes to get to half of that. Well, look at the form of the integrated rate law for first order reactions. If we plug in half-life term there. What do we know about A and A naught? At the half-life, what is A? One half of what you started with, right? Did we see a place where we can simplify this? Yeah, the A naughts. Boom. Gone. This is why this the term half-life winds up being used more often in first order reactions than the others. I'll show you why in more detail in a second. But the fact that for first order reactions, you get this A over A naught term allows you to cancel this out. It means that the half-life does not depend on what you start with. The amount that you start with has no bearing on how long it takes you to get to half of what of it being left. So that's why you hear things like radioactive isotopes have a constant half life. The half life of carbon carbon thirteen is five thousand seven hundred and thirty years. It takes five thousand seven hundred and thirty years to get to half the amount of carbon thirteen that you started with, regardless of how much you started with, because it's a first order reaction. Second order reactions and zero order reactions, that's not true. So 
to go off the medication example, um, most medication follows first order kinetics. Your body gets rid of it, breaks it down in first order kinetics. So you can, so most medications are, are going to have a half-life in your body of a certain amount of hours usually is, is how it's measured. Some medications, the shortest minutes. Um, alcohol, on the other hand, is not eliminated due, through first order kinetics. It's eliminated through zero order kinetics. It doesn't matter how much alcohol you drink, your body gets rid of it at most, at pretty much a constant rate. If you're indigenous, That'll affect K, but it won't affect the fact that it's first order kinetics. Or sorry, zero order. If kinetics. it's the time. If K is that rate constant. So different people based on your genetics and your environment and and you know the way we talked about how tolerance works in terms of medications the other day, right? Um, so you can actually change how fast your body gets rid of alcohol by training it to be used to getting rid of alcohol constantly. If you drink a lot, your body gets better at getting rid of alcohol, which makes sense. That's kind of how tolerance works. Tolerance, and again, in the medication sense. Um, what happens though, if I go back to the zero order kinetics here, if I try to do the same substitution for zero order reaction as for a first order reaction, I get 0 0.5 times Concentration A naught equals minus KT plus A naught. We don't get to make that same, we can't make that same simplification and canceling out our A naughts because they don't show up as a fraction now, right? We, when your body gets rid of alcohol, it gets rid of it at a constant rate of, for most people, it's somewhere near about one drink per hour is what they teach you when you first learn about drinking, right? is most people's bodies clear alcohol about that rate. And that's because you actually saturate the enzymes. So that your enzymes that are getting rid of, they're breaking down ethanol are working at full capacity. They're working as fast as they can. So it does, if you add more alcohol to the system, it doesn't speed them up because they're already working at full capacity. Giving someone who's already um, being worked, working as hard as they can, giving them more work is not gonna speed things up, right? It's a little bit different when you bring in psychology into it, but think about just like making a backlog of things. If I'm just sitting here, I, all I have to do is do my grading. You know, all that happens, I'm grading at a constant rate. If you add more grading, it's not changing how fast I'm getting, giving you output, right? I'm grading, already grading as fast as I can. That's how your body handles alcohol because it's present in much higher concentrations than most medications are. Most medications are present in the milligrams range, right? Um, alcohol is present in the grams of grams range. So you've got way more of it present. And that means it follows zero order kinetics, not first order kinetics. Second order kinetics is also weird. Second order kinetics does the same, something really similar to zero order kinetics, where if I do that substitution and try to solve for it, one over concentration A naught times 0.5 equals K T one half minus one over A naught. We can still solve these for T for T one half, but it's not going to be as nice and neat as first order where we get to cancel them out because we don't have fractions where we have A over A naught. So it's really the laws of logs working in our favor in that case. So that's mean? why second order and zero order aren't linear. And that's why they're not linear when you plot the natural log of them. First zero order reactions are linear when you just plot concentration versus time. Then when you add in like rate, so let me if we had a concentration of a versus time if it's zero order it's already a straight line just by plotting concentration versus time and to go back to our alcohol in the body analogy 
for example, instead of doing this in moles per liter, you could do this in drinks. Right? If this was five drinks, and this is hours, one, two, three, four, five. In case I should make it more consistent there. It doesn't matter how many drinks you have, the slope stays the same. If you have just one drink, your body clears it in one hour. If you have two drinks, it clears it in two hours, right? You get a, you get a straight line just by plotting concentration versus time. Second order reactions don't look like that. And first order reactions don't look like that either. They all have a form that you can plot that will give you a straight line. If it's a first order reaction, it's natural law versus time. If it's zero order, it's just concentration versus time. What is it going to be if it's second order? One over A versus time. We'll give you a straight line. That one will look like that. That'll look like that. This one winds up because it's a one over, you wind up with it looking that like that. So there's a, a weird the way the integration works, there's a negative sign in there that gets introduced. So this means that we can tell if we have just one system, we don't need the method of initial rates. Method of initial rates is great for figuring out your rate model. If you don't have that data, you just have a set of data of concentration versus time, you can still figure out if it's first order, second order, or zero order by making these three graphs. Make these three graphs, figure out which one of them, which one of them is linear, and that tells you is it first order, is it zero order, is it second order? And once you know that, the slope also gives you K in each case. If you know K, if you know the slope, you know your initial concentrations, you can always get the concentration at any given time. So let's do an example. Here's a reaction about two nitrogen dioxides combined to form nit dinitrogen tetraoxide. What is the half life? And then and the time required to progress to, to a quarter of the initial concentration if we start with these assumptions. That one's key. And that tells us which equation we have to use. K is going to be K no matter what. It's always going to be the slope of the linear form of it. It always factors into an integrated rate loss. We need K to do any calculations, but knowing which equation to use is going to depend on the rate law, the order of the reaction. So if we know it's second order in nitrogen dioxide, we can write well, one over a concentration of NO2 is equal to K times T minus one over concentration at time equals zero. And we know to use that equation because it's second order. So how do we get the half life? Plug and chug? What are we plugging? We know what the constant is. We know our initial concentration is 0.15. And at the half life, what's the concentration? Half of that. So 
1 over 0.15 times 0.5 equals given to us. If it wasn't given to us, we would have to either calculate it from some other information or get it from the slope of the of the um, of the graph. Thank you. So because it's a second order reaction, we get slightly different units on K. So it's one over molarity times seconds. Not plus, it's minus. Now we're ready to plug and shove. Fifty. What are our units on that? Seconds. Because k is in seconds. Whatever time units k is in will give you your time units for for t. You got like six thousand two hundred fifty. Oh, sorry. That's what you meant by sixty two fifty. So if this was a first order reaction, the time to get to a quarter of your initial concentration would be two half-lives. Cut it in half, then cut that remaining half in half. So you get that exponential decay approaching, approaching zero, but it'll never truly reach zero mathematically. Physically speaking, it does eventually. Eventually you wind up with it being so close to zero, there's only one atom left that's left to react and that atom will eventually react. But mathematically, it's an asymptote. It'll approach zero, but never truly reach it. In this case though, because this isn't first order, we don't have a constant half-life, which means the time to get to a quarter of your starting material is not simply double this. We can solve this the same way though, except put in 0.25 instead of 0.5 here. And then we're not solving for the half-life. We're solving just for T or if you could it's not a commonly used term, but you could say it's that the quarter life. You wouldn't be wrong to say that. People would just look at you, tilt their head funny. Time to get to a quarter of what we started with is what? Should be more, I believe it's more than double. Yeah, I got a ten thousand four hundred. Mm -hmm. Graduation is a bonus. Congratulations! Congratulations! <laughs> 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 no, it's actually a little bit less.
to get to a quarter because it's a second order reaction. Second order reactions, you can't make that assumption that it's all the half life is always the same. So for half life is really mostly a useful idea when you're dealing with first order kinetics. Anything that's not first order kinetics, you can calculate the half life like we just did, but it depends on how much you started with. So it's not, it's highly situational and dependent. What do you use if you have like a reaction with multiple orders? Typically, if we have a reaction with first order in one reactant, first order in another reactant, um, most times that's happening. If it's happening in the natural world, one of those reactants is a constant. So it might be first order, like rusting, rusting um, iron. It's first order in concentration of oxygen and first order in the surface area of the iron. It's a solid. But the fact that the concentration of oxygen in our atmosphere is relatively constant means that that's not going to change. And so we can basically ignore um, the effect of, of the concentration of oxygen because it's going to be the same no matter what. If we're talking about geological time scales, then it does get a little bit trickier. But again, a lot of naturally occurring reactions wind up being true first order reactions where they're not first order here and first order here. Like radio, radiological dating is based on, it's a whole radioactivity is all just true first order reactions. But basically that's, that's what you would do is you try to see if you can make the justification that um, one of your concentrations is not changing. Otherwise you have to get into partial differentials because you could look at taking the, doing the integral of change in concentration of A with respect to change in time at a constant B, and then you have change, integrate the change in the concentration of B with respect to changing time at a constant A. And that's what we call partial differential equations. PDEs are not particularly fun to solve. Um, I don't think I actually, mm -hmm. granted I didn't take all the math that I could have in undergrad, but those didn't show up until grad school. Um, if you go more on the math side, you might see those a little bit earlier, but upper division stuff. So how did you figure out like half like the second and first and zero order? Like how did they like decide graphs like this? So they started they looked at it like, well, that looks a lot like an exponential. What is the base for that exponential? Oh, it looks like it's E. And they just formed the equations from the graphs. They kind of were happening simultaneously. They were figuring out that this that this had this shape. Um, and then they, the mathematicians were the ones saying, okay, well, if we look at this rate and we treat it like it's a different, like, like it's a uh, fraction, we can just integrate both sides. These were all kind of happening simultaneously because, you know, Newton invented calculus, not invented. Leibniz and Newton, as you discover mathematical principles, they invented the notations that we use to describe calculus um, in the 1600s. And so this was only a few hundred years later. Um, and so when you look at that, the timeline of human history, that's pretty close to happening at the same time. Um, be able to like isolate concentrations because it's like, it's pretty hard to do that. Well, so we'll get an example of doing method of initial rates, which would have been, they figured that out first. Um, we'll do that next week, but basically there are a lot of it, come, these earliest um, examples come down to Beer's Law, uh, that's it. That's absorbance. You guys remember measuring absorbance and how we can tie it directly to the concentration. Yeah. We measured we measured the equilibrium constant at the end of the quarter. Remember those big beige boxes, and you took the little test tube and you put it in the box. It's like that week before finals. So maybe that was the one that everybody dropped. You hadn't dropped the lab yet. It's a relic, rather yeah. intensive lab um, that takes a long time. So maybe that's why. Um, we definitely did this lab last quarter, though, because we got out the spectrometers, yeah. spectral photometers, and we measured absorbance and then tied it to concentration, we use that to measure equilibrium constants. 
You can also use it to measure the rate of a reaction. If your reaction is happening in one of those cuvettes, one of those little test tubes, you measure the absorbance at time equals 30 seconds, at time equals 60 seconds, at time equals 90 seconds. Oh, that was the one that we did all the time, right? We didn't bring time into it because it was oh. an equilibrium lab. We did time for something else. But regardless, um, absorbance and absorbing visible light is one of the first ways they had them. They figured out of measuring um, concentration. And that's one that actually translates pretty well to be able to do it in real time. Just add, you, know, you just have a stopwatch every five seconds, measure your absorbance. All right. Well, in there, today is Thursday, right? <laughs> okay. It's just been one of those weeks. So um, there will be a quiz on some of this stuff, probably a method of initial rates problem. And maybe one of these, which is it first, second, or third, based on a graph question, but we don't like multiple choice questions because they pretty much are, right? Use process of elimination. Shouldn't, shouldn't be too hard. Again, just think about some chemistry over the weekends. Oh, uh, I can do it when you get home here. But... I have your kind of.